Okay, well, good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for spending your Tuesday morning with me. Greetings from Stanford. Uh, I want to start out with a story. It's about a sergeant, Sergeant Edward Montoya. About 10 years ago, Sergeant Montoya was an Army medic stationed outside Mosul. It was right before Christmas, and he was at the mess digging into a piece of cheesecake. And all of a sudden, out of the corner of his eyes, he saw a flash. The boom of all booms, it was a terrorist lighting himself up and blowing up the mess hall. He ducked under the table and was safe himself. But when the, the, the furor ended and he came out and looked, it was carnage all around him. All kinds of people injured, complexity. What was he going to do? Which person does he treat? Who can be saved? And that's really what we're going to be talking about today is the issue of complexity. And so as you can see, Sergeant Montoya is facing a difficult challenge, how to deal with the complexity of war. While maybe not the same kind of personal stress, lots of people deal with complexity. Janet Yellen, for example, Chairman of the Federal Reserve, deals in complexity. Mark Zuckerberg, CEO of Facebook, does as well. And believe it or not, even crickets do. It's not that easy to be a cricket. You've got a short life with a lot to do. The rest of us, we deal with complexity as well. We've got too many devices. We've got to deal with a tax code we can't understand. Our kids want things. Our jobs want things. We have too much to do, too much to cope with. And what, what today's seminar is really about is how do people cope with that complexity, the complexity of the federal economy, the complexity of Facebook, the complexity of our own lives. And the argument today, the basic argument is you cope with complexity by being simple, and in particular, simple rules. What are simple rules? You can think of simple rules as being rules of thumb or heuristics. They're cognitive shortcuts. They work because they save time and effort, and they do it by focusing attention and simplifying your thinking. Let me get a little bit more specific about what I mean, the features of simple rules. Simple rules are, first of all, simple. There's only maybe a handful, two, three, four, five. Second thing is simple rules are unique. Simple rules depend on the person and the situation. Your rules aren't necessarily my rules. Third, simple rules relate to a defined activity. It's not a platitude like being nice to your mother on Mother's Day, and it's not solving world hunger either. It's much more precise on a defined activity. Let me give you an example of, a simp of simple rules. Simple rules are simple. Take the three food rules of Michael Pollan. Michael Pollan, as many of you know, is a UC Berkeley professor and, and renowned food guru. He's got three simple rules for choosing what to eat. Number one, eat real food as food that your grandmother recognizes. Second, eat small portions. Third, eat mostly plants. Within those three rules, you can pick blueberries, kale, or whatever. I can choose something else, but we're following those three simple rules. Second point, those rules depend on the person and the situation. So take the Stanford football team. They have rules for eating too, but they're not the same as Michael Pollan. For example, the football team's rules are eat breakfast because they're students and they often rush into class and skip breakfast. Their second rule is stay hydrated because they're really active guys who need to stay hydrated. And their third rule is you can eat anything you want as long as you can pick it, pluck it, or kill it. Notice there's some similarities with Michael Pollan, non-processed food, but after that, no issues about portion control like middle-aged Michael Pollan, and plenty of meat for guys who are still building muscle and uh, using them. Let's take a corporate example. Crowdfunding sites, Indiegogo versus Kickstarter, and how they choose what projects get on their sites. At Indiegogo, anything goes as far as projects go, anything that's legal, that is. So you can fund your root canal, you can fund your trip to Europe, you can fund the Jamaican bobsled team, you can fund your art project or your business. What products get featured or what projects get featured on the Indiegogo site? It's done strictly by an algorithm, popularity of your project and the effort that you put into promoting your project. 
Let's contrast that with Kickstarter, also picking crowdfunding projects. But Kickstarter curates into 13 project categories and rejects about 25% of the projects that are submitted. How do you get a featured project? It's staff picks, not an algorithm. It's staff picks, subjective versus objective. The Indiegogo philosophy is the Internet is about the Internet is for everyone. The Internet should be a place where everybody deserves a rich uncle. As long as you put in effort, you get to put your project up there. In contrast, Kickstarter is coming from a philosophy of public funding for art and curation. What's the point? Same basic business, different rules depending on the person and the situation. Final point, simple rules relate to a defined activity. Again, it's not about solving health care. It's about particular activities, like choosing what you're going to have for lunch today or picking crowdfunding projects. So that's what the, really the meaning of simple rules is. Another thing I want to talk about a bit this morning is the idea of types of rules. Types of rules matter for a couple reasons. One is some of them are easy to learn and some of them are hard to learn. And so obviously you have to work harder to learn the ones that are hard to learn. Hard to learn. The second point and why it's important to learn it is because some rules are actually more important for performance than other rules. Let's take a look at some of the rules. These are the six types. We're going we're gonna to explore a couple of the types. A common rule, easy to learn rule, is what's, what we're calling a boundary rule. Boundary rules cover situations like yes, no decisions, or situations where you have too many alternatives. So you have lots of alternatives, and you have to choose a smaller number. I'll give you some examples to bring it down, into, down from hyperspace. The Weinstein Company. Weinstein Company is one of the major Hollywood movie companies, has brought you a lot of featured films that I'm sure you've all seen. Pictured in the slide is The Imitation Game, for example. They also did Silver Linings Playbook and a number of other hit movies, Chocolat, uh, The Artist, and so on. The key process at Weinstein, or one of the key processes, is picking movies. You see thousands of scripts in a year. Which movies are you actually going to do? Well, it turns out the Weinstein Company has a couple simple rules. One of them is always pick a flawed but sympathetic main character. In the case of the imitation game, it's Alan Turing, a person that I think most of us would agree as we're watching this flick. He's a really annoying guy, even kind of a jerk, but yet you like him. He also has a basic human condition that he's dealing with, not just jerkdom, but he's also, he's also a gay at a time when gays aren't respected and, and, or even tolerated or even legal. So it's a flawed but sympathetic main character, basic human condition. Silver Lining Playbook, if you remember that movie with Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Lawrence, it was about dealing with mental illness. Bradley Cooper was, was a, a, a bipolar, and it was dealing with his, his coping with that condition. Now, does that mean that Weinstein would actually, does every movie actually have those two, flawed but sympathetic main character, basic human condition? Actually, no. So Weinstein would never make a movie like Gone Girl, where it was hard to like any characters, or The Birdman, again, a movie that's hard to like any characters. You, the, Weinstein would also not do something like Mission Impossible. Where's the basic human condition there? So the key point here is there are lots of movies that could be chosen. They, they, they focus on a few simple ones, a few simple rules to go through that vast number of movie scripts to pick out what are some, going to be some of the best ones. Another example I'll give you. This is a smaller company called Frontier Dental. Their problem is the sales process, key, key issue for them. Turns out they were calling on about 100 dentists a day, each of their salespeople, trying to sell a new product around. It was an innovative tooth alignment uh, system. Calling on about 100 people a day, getting maybe two or three dentists to, to listen to them and maybe buy. Not very fun job if you're the salesperson, not very profitable if you're Frontier Dental. And so the question is, what do we do? So they started thinking about which dentists had actually been listening and how they're going to figure that out. One idea was maybe it's dentists who are between the ages of 35 and 50. You know, not old enough to maybe have an established practice, but not so old that they're not novel and innovative. 
not to offend those of you listeners who are over 50, because as we all know, there are many 50-year-olds who are innovative. And in fact, those rules don't work. Those digital rules didn't work because it didn't actually capture who was innovative and because it was really hard to figure out, for example, how old the dentist was. Instead, they went to two other rules that were pretty easy to check and yet got what they wanted. First rule was always go to a dentist who has a great website. That signals innovation. Second, avoid any dentist that's had four finance charges in the year. Check their credit report, bad credit report, don't go there. So by using those two rules, great website, good credit, they got innovative dentists who paid their bills, and Frontier Dental had a major increase, not only in their sales, but in their profitability. Let me give you another second kind of rule. Another kind of simple rule is the how-to how to rule. Again, a common rule, easy to learn. This one, however, is not about picking alternatives. Rather, it's about uh, guiding the basic steps of executing a task. Important when innovation matters, believe it or not, and also when future situations are variable, when you've got a lot of situations to, to fit into and you can't just have a checklist that fits everybody. Let me give you an example. Airbnb. Airbnb is a pretty interesting company, as I think we all know. I think we've all been, many of us have probably tried Airbnb. It turns out for Airbnb that one of the key activities is around helping hosts be better hosts. How do you do that? What are the rules? When you're trying, when you're talking about hosts from San Francisco to Bangladesh, when you're talking about hosting in a treehouse, an apartment, luxury villa, or just a plain everyday house, what are the simple rules? Well, first off, when their Airbnb was starting out and started opening up new territories, they recruited hosts at parties, at referral parties. You, current hosts bring potential future hosts. The idea here was they, this would help Airbnb get the right kind of a host, a host that had the slightly funky Airbnb vibe, not, for example, uh, apartment managers who were sort of more sterile, instead people who really cared about their space. Once they have a cadre of hosts, how do you help hosts be good hosts? A couple simple rules. Professional photographs of your, of your property, so look, looking as good as it can. Always ensuring that you give your guests local tips on what's going on at the farmer's market, what's the best museum, how to use the subway. Whatever it is in your market, it's about local tips. Third tip, always clean soap. Clean soap is an immediate signal to a guest that, well, let's put it this way, if it's not clean soap, if somebody's been already washing with the soap, it's an immediate signal to the guest, mm, maybe this isn't the place I want to be. So, a few simple rules covering campsites to castles. How about another company and another common problem, meetings. We all spend more time than we want to in a meeting. That was an issue at Twitter. How do we simplify our meetings? How do we get rid of this complexity of the meetings? How do we, how do we make them more efficient? A couple key rules, regardless of the meeting. No PowerPoints, because they take way too long to prepare, waste of time and also get people talking too long. And second rule, no canceling. If we've got a meeting set up, you've got to show up. People canceling messes up everybody's schedule, no canceling. Within that, you can do what you want. Maybe a third example, we'll get a little outside business and get a little, little edgier. How about the white stripes? The white stripes, some of you may know, some of you may not, but the white stripes did an album in the early 2000s called White Blood Cells major album of that decade. They wrote, they did that album in 10 days, 10 days, 18 songs. What they were doing was creating innovation in an amazing short amount of time. How did they do that? They had a couple simple rules. No covers, meaning you can't play somebody else's song. No blues, no guitar solos, no slide guitar, no bass. Within that, do what you want. And I think the subtle point here is I know many of you are in the tech sector. Many, many times we think innovation is about having no rules, doing what you want to do. In fact, the most in innovative people from Claude Monet to Jack White, they have rules. What they're doing is not, they're not outside the box. What they're doing is creating their own box. And within that box, 
creating great innovation. Another kind of rule that I think you might find interesting and I think is really important, now we're getting into harder rules. It turns out it's harder for people to learn about things like priority rules, coordinating rules, and what we're going to focus on here, timing rules. Yet timing rules are one of those kinds of rules that's harder to learn, bigger payback. Where does a timing rule fit? It fits in situations you want to specify when to act. Rhythms, sequences of activities, maybe deadlines. They're pretty useful when you need to get things done and timing matters. They're also pretty useful when you want to get started, get going. Let me give you a couple of examples. One of them is Pixar. Pixar, as you may know, uh, started out, the first, first movie was Toy Story. Toy Story was a huge hit. Toy Story is still a huge hit. But Toy Story had a problem. It took Pixar four years to develop Toy Story. It's pretty tough to have a viable business if you only get a movie out every four years. It also is pretty hard to attract talented people to Pixar if it takes you four years to see what happens with your work. So what Pixar executives did was actually started to go into a timing rule. And that timing rule was one movie a year. Let's do one movie a year. It was actually not that easy to implement because what that took is actually building a pipeline of a year of a movie that's about to release in the next year, two years, three years, four years. So you actually had to have a pipeline of four movies to do that. But you'd go from step to step to step. But what, so it took Pixar a couple of years to do this, but they eventually ended up with essentially one movie a year, whether it was Ratatouille, Finding, Finding Nemo, Up, whatever. They also put in a second timing rule, which was every four, every once a year, a movie, and release that movie at Thanksgiving, which is the major, which is the start of one of the major uh, movie-going seasons, particularly for families in the year. So once a year, release at Thanksgiving. Once a year, release at Thanksgiving. Since that time, they've switched up the rule every a little bit, and sometimes they were released in the summer. And every so often, they have a hiccup. For example, a year where they just don't feel that the movie lives up to Pixar standards. But otherwise, they stick to the rhythm. Another example, maybe one you don't know. This is a company called Primquist. Primquist is in the somewhat unglamorous business of concrete. But while concrete may be unglamorous, concrete, it turns out, is important. After water, it's the highest per capita income or consumption good in the world. And it is also a major polluter. It is the third largest source of man-made carbon dioxide pollution. Primquist executives and scientists started studying how to make concrete better. And actually went back to the ancient Egyptians, who were the originators of concrete. The ancient Egyptians whipped up their concrete using blood and horse hair to make it better. Primquist decided they maybe didn't want to use blood and horse hair, but they were going to use a few modern equivalents of that and came up with an innovative concrete that had that halved the energy consumption with less cracking, which means you needed to use less, and in general, uh, less use because it was stronger. So an eco win-win. They took this concrete, tried to sell it, and in particular took it to Las Vegas to a, to a convention of people who were interested in concrete. I have to admit, I wasn't there. Had, about, had a lot of interest because it was a great product. Had over 100 people who wanted to be sellers of, of this concrete. The problem for Primquist is how do you pick? Which, which 100, which, which five, which two, who? They had a couple of rules, but, one of them, but two of them were timing rules. In fact, one of them, I'm gonna focus on one of them. And that was, we're a small company, we can only add a new partner every month, every three months. And so they got into a rhythm of every three months a new partner, every three months a new partner. If we try to do it every month, we, we just don't have the capacity. If it's too long than that, we lose the momentum of our product. So a very simple timing rule, every three months we add a partner. Another kind of rule that I think is, is also a pretty interesting rule is what's known as a stopping rule. Stopping rules, it turns out, is the hardest rule to learn, yet one, yet one of the most important. When to call it quits, in other words. When do we stay? When do we go? First of all, I should talk a little bit about Primquist before I go switch over to Steve Blank. But Primquist, the concrete company we just talked about, they also had a stopping rule for their partners. That rule was if a, if a partner does not 
adopt our product within three months, we drop that partner. So in other words, if we set up a partner, they don't develop, they don't do anything with our concrete for three months, time to stop, time to move on to a new partner. Another, another stopping rule is, is, uh, is offered by my colleague Steve Blank. Steve Blank, you may recognize some of you as the author of Lean Launchpad, well-known innovator in the, in the entrepreneurship space. Many of you may know his rule about get out of the building, talk to 100 customers. You may also even know his building, make sure those conversations are face-to-face. -face. But what I want to focus on is his stopping rule. When do you decide that your business isn't going to work, you need to pivot? And he's got a very simple stopping rule. You have to answer four questions. Does the customer see the problem? If the customer sees a problem, will they pay to solve it? Second question. Third question. If the customer will, will buy a product, will the customer buy it from you? And the fourth question is, can you make the product? If you answer no to any one of those four questions, it's time to stop that business, pivot, and move on to your next, uh, next crack of the business model. Finally, before I go on to the next part, just a, just a word about crickets. I started about crickets at the very beginning. You're probably wondering what, what in the world, what are crickets doing in the story? I'm not going to do too much on crickets because, after all, this is a business presentation. But, but let me just say that it turns out animals use a lot of simple rules because, after all, animals aren't all that smart. They don't have a lot of time. And so you have to keep it simple for an animal. Crickets have a great mating stopping rule that you might recognize. How does Ms. Cricket under, recognize when she's found Mr. Cricket, who's Mr. Wright? Turns out she uses a stopping rule. She picks Mr. Wright if he can chirp three times a second or more. But if she can't find Mr. Wright in 24 hours, time's limited. She's got to move on. She just takes the next available. Some of you may recognize that as also bar behavior. It's also known as the variable, variable stopping rule with the threshold. Overall, what's the point here? Stopping rules. People forget stopping rules. They're super important. In fact, they could be the most important type of rule. Finally, to wrap it up, let's just talk a little bit about how do you create simple rules. You determine an objective. Keep it specific. What do you want more or less of? Find the bottleneck. What's keeping you from really creating that objective? And then crafting rules from expert advice, maybe from your friends and colleagues, tracking your own experience. Let me give you an example. Google. Google's objective has very often been growth. What's stopping their growth? What's the bottleneck? There are a couple of bottlenecks, but probably the biggest bottleneck, at least historically, has been how do we find enough great computer scientists to develop our products? So it's actually a hiring bottleneck. How do you find great computer scientists? Obviously, you can check good schools. Obviously, you can check for grades. But after that, how do you tell a great computer scientist? Turns out Google has a couple simple rules, which they developed from tracking their own behavior and success, from best practice, and from just talking. Google favors people who are also not just top computer scientists from a transcript point of view, but who are slightly eccentric because they're typically more creative. Google wants computer scientists who never fudge on their resume because integrity is huge. And Google likes computer scientists who are referred by other Googlers because, after all, other Googlers are some of the best the best uh, people at spotting the kind of people that would work at Google. Our, prims, our friends at Primquist, just to use them again, our concrete people, once again, their growth was, their, their bottleneck was growth and profit. Their, their, excuse me, their objective is growth and profit. Their bottleneck was partnering. Their simple rules, I told you those before, three months, otherwise we stop. Every three months we add somebody. They also had an interesting rule around pick partners who have a screen machine. You and I probably don't know what a screen machine is, but in the concrete world, that signals innovative, high-quality manufacturers and partners. Overall, what's the point? Simple rules add value, I think, in your life because they make your decision-making faster, because they give you more flexibility in what you do. Think Weinstein's, lots of different kinds of movies. And they give you better coordination. So in summary, if you're sitting if you're sitting at your office today and you've got too many devices and too much to do and too many meetings to go to and you're worrying about your kids and you can't keep track of what's going on in your email, 
maybe it's time for simple rules. Hopefully this webinar will help you think about that in a, in a way that maybe give you some peace of mind and a whole lot more simplicity. And maybe to quote one of my favorite simple rules, guys, Leonardo da Vinci, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. So when complexity has you down, try simple rules. Thanks a lot for listening. So I think let's, let's start. We've got a number of questions from the audience. So let's start with the first one that asks, how would you recommend to start creating personal simple rules rather than business simple rules? OK, well, great question, how to, how to create personal rules. I think the first thing to think about is, is really think about your life and what is it you want more of, for example, more family time, more travel time, more me time, or what do you want less of, less hassle, uh, less commuting, less whatever. So think of what is your objective. So the first thing is what is your objective. For example, do you want, let's say it's better health. The second thing is what's the bottleneck? What's really keeping you from better health, join your kids more, uh, whatever it is that you want. Let's say it's better health. Well, then you have to, that's actually probably one of the trickiest parts of it is what, what is keeping you from better health? For example, is it, is it, is it exercise or is it diet? So I, so I had a friend, for example, for whom she thought about exercise, she thought about diet, and then realized, well, you know, it's really, um, you know, exercise, I'm, I'm doing enough exercise now. I, I don't really have time given my work schedule to do more exercise. It's really got to be diet. Then what this person did was started tracking her diet choices. For example, what was she eating every day? Did that for a couple of days. Realized that her bottleneck, her problem, which is now we're focusing on what's really keeping her from health, was, was she was pretty good during the day, but once it was after dinner, she was having that extra glass of wine or she was having that Ben and Jerry's. She was snacking after, after dinner. And so that became, she started focusing in on that. She also asked for some friends for some tips. She read a couple of diet books and came up with a couple of simple rules about snacking after dinner. First of all, since she couldn't completely eliminate them, she said, all right, no snacking during the week, but I can do it on the weekends. So weekends are OK. Second one was, I'm never going to snack out of a, a bag. My snacks are always in a bowl. She had a couple other rules, basically just, just two or three rules. And so at the end of a hard day, a tired day, when she's, things have been hectic, when whatever has been going on has been going on, and it's, you know, her resistance is down. She just relied on those couple simple rules and actually lost 15 pounds pretty fast. So what's the idea? It's really the same idea as for, for businesses. What's the objective that you're really trying to achieve? What are the bottlenecks that are really keeping you from that? Is it exercise? Is it diet? Whatever. And then what are a couple of rules, two, three, four, five, that are keeping you from getting there? And again, use ideas from your friends read books, or just track your own behavior. So another question uh, that came up here is, how do you um, understand what is that bottleneck? It seems like a pretty crucial element in the process. And what are some techniques uh, that you can share about how to, to understand what the bottleneck is and address it? Yeah, the bottleneck is actually really, really crucial. And, and as it wasn't the health example. It wasn't clear what it was. In a sales example, it's often not clear. You know, is, it, we, are, we don't have sales because poor salespeople, bad product, good competitors, whatever. It takes some, you have to think about that for a while. What we've seen successful in businesses is getting together people, perhaps several sets of people, from different parts of the organization or different levels. So for example, a team of people at high levels, middle levels, and low levels to brainstorm what the bottleneck could be. And to try to not just see what the surface bottleneck may be, but maybe the underlying cause. So for example, in the case of Google, the problem was inability to, to develop certain kinds of apps. But the real underlying problem is, was lack of computer scientists. And actually, Yahoo is facing that same problem these days. How do they get mobile apps? It's not, the problem is not mobile apps. The problem is actually computer scientists. So trying to, so to summarize that, two strategies for getting at bottlenecks. One is several different teams within your, in your, your organization brainstorming about it and just trying to come up with ideas and then thinking those through. Second idea is to go beyond the surface and try to think of the cause behind the superficial manifestation. So what's the underlying root cause causality and, and focus in on that. 
You can tell, by the way, if you've got the wrong bottleneck is if you try and change the rules around that bottleneck and nothing happens. It doesn't really improve. You're probably on the wrong bottleneck. Great. Thank you. Um, one other question that has to do maybe with, with uh, the wrong rules being created is what happens if you define a simple rule and the rule isn't working or how do you know that it's not the right simple rule and how do you pivot or change that, those rules? What are some examples you can give of that? Okay, so you, what about the wrong rules? Well, first of all, the good news is that there are a lot of situations when just having a rule is better than no rule. So you don't have to have the perfect rule. And oftentimes you start out and it may not be a good rule. So first point is don't stress about getting the absolute optimal rule. Just get a rule and you usually be better off. Second thing is how do you know, well, maybe you did actually end up with, with rules that aren't working. You can, you can figure that out by if whatever it is you're trying to achieve is, not again, not getting better. So you, you've changed your, your, your rules for sales people's calling patterns and you aren't getting more sales. That's suggesting that those rules aren't working. You've either got the bottle, wrong bottleneck or you've got the wrong rules. So you look, so the way you tell the rules really are, are, are not working is you're not achieving the objective, whether it's a more innovative product, whether it's more sales, whether it's uh, better movies, whether it's hiring more computer scientists. If you're not getting the action that you wanted, that's telling you the, either the rules or the bottleneck aren't right. Third, when you've got the wrong rules, what do you do? You go back to the process. And in particular, track your own behavior. So for example, if it's, if it's you're failing to get the right computer scientist, track what's wrong. What, what's, what, what are you doing when you're getting it right? What are you doing when you're getting it wrong? Track your own rules. The other thing you can do is also ask, ask professional colleagues, what do, what do they do? They might give you some ideas. They might be able to critique you. For example, you're trying to hire and people don't want to work for you. Well, if you really ask your friends, what's wrong with my company, they may be able to say, you know, people don't like this about your company or that about your company. It gives you some insight. So track your behavior, ask some friends, maybe check some expert sources. All right, so we have a number of questions around how do you make sure you stick to the rules? Some people are commenting that, you know, what if you're more of a free spirit or if you have more <laughs> free-spirited uh, culture in your company? Or how do, you know, how do you just make sure that you, you stick to the rules that you set for yourselves? And what are some, some ways to address that? Okay, well, I can, I can relate to, to not wanting to stick to the rules because, you know, that's why, that's why I like living on the West Coast. You don't have not so many rules. Um, but certainly, certainly if you take somebody like Jack White, and the white stripes, they aren't exactly your Boy Scout rule followers. But yet I think what, what's important to realize is that people are more innovative when they have a couple of rules. Whether it's IDEO, whether it's the white stripes, whatever. A few rules, define the box, and define, define where creativity will come from. So first point is, is to recognize that innovation comes from I'm not a thousand rules, but a couple of rules is actually where innovation comes from because you get some degree of leverage on your time. In fact, when we first did the research around this, these, these ideas, we saw that, that, that certain parts of the country had lots of rules and it was bureaucracy, but the West Coast problem was not enough rules. Too much craziness. Second, second thing that you were mentioned that I was asked was about, well, how do you stick to the rules? I'm not really a rule-following kind of girl or guy. What do you do? Here I think is, first of all, is keep the number small. Keep it down. If you have trouble, if, you don't like, if you're not a rule person, try two rules, maybe even one rule. You'll get, you may get a lot of results just even on one or two rules. Five rules may be too much for you. It may just be two rules or even one will be able to do it. And it's easier to follow two rules, both because if you're a free spirit, it's easier. It's also easier if, if, you've, if, if you're tired, if you're stressed out, and so on. Uh, it's, people particularly value, particularly do well with, with, with a few rules in just those situations where things are hectic, when they're stressed out, when they're hassled, they, when, they, when their mental reservoir is low. One or two things, that's all I can remember, that's the perfect number. Great. So one more question, I think, and then we'll, we'll be ready to wrap it up. So there, we have a question around, what if you manage a diverse team with lots of different types of personalities? How do you make sure that the rules that you set are a good fit for all these different personalities and, and behavioral styles? 
Uh, yeah, actually, simple rules are actually really good for that because simple rules are simple, which usually accommodate lots of personality styles. I, what I've seen is one of the effective ways of doing this is actually meet with your team. Uh, in fact, Mary, Mary Barra, this is a bit high level perhaps, but Mary Barra, the CEO of General Motors, was looking into General Motors dress code. And she realized that the dress code had proliferated into, into several pages of what to wear. It would cover people on the line, people in the office, people who are an R&D people, and whatever, people who are test track drivers. And they had all these rules for all these different kinds of people, what to wear. And somewhat symbolically, but also somewhat pragmatically, she said, let's forget it. We're going to one rule, dress appropriately. And we figure that GM employees are big boys and big girls. They know what dress appropriately means. And so she went down to dress appropriately. She got some feedback, however, from a middle manager who said, you know, dress appropriately is great, but, you know, sometimes my people show up at a client meeting and they think it's casual Friday, but it's not. And so what she said back to that person was, understand, what you need to do is go back to your team and explain why dress appropriate is, is important and what dress appropriate means in different settings. So what did those employees end up doing? Still doing their own thing on clothes, but for those who are maybe a little more on the casual side, they had an outfit at the office that if there was going to be a client meeting, they dressed up for it and then dressed down. But they understood what, they had a better understanding of what dress appropriate meant. So hopefully that gives you some insight into how to let, the, let a simple rule work for many sizes. Wonderful. So I think this has been really informative. I want to thank Professor Eisenhardt again for spending uh, this time with her and sharing some of the insights from her extensive research and her book uh, on the topic of simple rules. I invite you again to learn more about our offering, uh, the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Certificate, at our website create.stanford.edu and to enroll in our next webinar uh, on July 16th on negotiations and how to get more of what you want. Uh, so with that, I want to wish you a good rest of the day and uh, hope to see you at our next webinar.